Welcome back to our video module on dynamics. Thus far, we've looked at cycloidal motion with a stone rolling around a tire. And we've looked at position, velocity, and acceleration as a function of time. We've also looked at what happens with a bead on a rod spinning around in a circle when we're investing Coriolis acceleration. In both of these situations, we were given the path and we needed to find the velocity and the acceleration. But what would happen if we needed to identify the forces acting on these particles? I'm going to suggest that we've already done this type of problem. Let's reimagine our cart. Our cart that we used to do a fair bit when we were looking at sinusoidal forces and springs and, and um, damping mechanisms moved with some sort of response and we can imagine that now we're going to apply some sort of force to the center of the cart and we'll pretend that we're applying that force some angle theta. Now this is a simple problem that we already know the solution to. We take a look at it and we say oh well we know that uh, force times cosine theta equals mass times the acceleration that's just going to be in the x direction. And if I pressed in a little harder on that you'd say well I took the dot product in just the i direction so I'm only looking at components in the i direction but then I might say well why didn't you take a look at things going in the j direction let's take the j dot product well we get a negative f sine theta and we would see that equals m y double dot and of course you'd say well that's complete nonsense the thing can't move in the y direction so what's happening here this system is a constrained system and it's constrained in the following way the acceleration is only in the x direction. So when we do our equation of motion, sure, f equals ma, but we remember that this is our acceleration. So if we take the j dot product, we're going to end up with a zero on the right hand side, which, which makes sense. There is no movement in the vertical direction. This is the same type of action that we're going to use looking at constrained motion. We're going to define what the acceleration is, and then we'll use our free body diagram to define what the force is. From there, we can do anything we want. So let's take a look at our cycloid example. In red, remember that the acceleration was simply negative v squared over r in the j direction. In this example, we're going to go ahead and neglect gravity. So if we wanted to know the force required to keep that stone rolling on that tire, it would simply be, we do our force equals mass times acceleration, and we'd see that the force equals negative mv squared over r in the j direction. Great, let's try something a little less trivial. We'll remember our um, slider on a rod and the acceleration in this case was 2 v omega e theta. Remembering that v is the velocity in this direction or the tangential velocity. And if we wanted to remember the definition of these uh, unit vectors, we'd remember that this is er in the radial direction, this is e theta in the polar direction. This is the second step we usually follow in these types of problems where we identify a coordinate frame that moves in some way with the moving particle or the constrained particle. And I like this problem because if we want to draw our free body diagram, the force is very simple. It's this, it's F, and it's in the E theta direction. So now we can write down our equations of motion. We can make a relationship between force and acceleration. The force equals mass times acceleration, and in this case, our force is F e theta equals mass times 2 vt omega e theta. Now, just because of the way this problem's work, the f everything's lined up perfectly, so it makes it really easy. Furthermore, we can get a relationship between the force and the torque. We know that the torque equals F cross R, and in this case, for obvious reasons, the force and the radius are always perpendicular. So we can say that um, the torque over the radius equals the force. And 
this is all in the e theta direction 2 m v t omega or if we wanted a relationship between the torque and say the uh, tangential velocity we'd have 2 m r v t omega a reminder that this equation only works when this acceleration is true and remember for this acceleration we had said that uh, omega is a constant. So in summary when we look at constrained motion the first order of business is to identify exactly what is the acceleration restricted to what is it constrained to we can use our position equations to identify how the particle has to move the next thing we can do is we can use our free body diagram in conjunction with a frame of reference that generally is joined to the particle. It just makes it easier. It doesn't have to be that way. From there, we solve our equations of motion and we find out what x, x dot, x double dot is, or here we found the relationship between the torque and the velocity. We really have a lot of tools at our disposal. So I hope that gives you a basic understanding of the starting point of constrained motion where your understanding will be put to the test is doing specific problems that require you to go back and forth between rotating reference frames and stationary reference frames and unit basis vectors. Thank you for joining me for this video on constrained motion.